Welcome to Trash Matters, the podcast channel from Waste and Recycling Magazine. And I am your host, Kirtana. Plastic is an amazing material. It is light, cost effective, durable, and above all, it's versatile. And that makes it an indispensable part of our life. On the one hand, there is an increasing demand for high quality recycled plastic feedstock. And on the other, the global recycling rate is just 15% as far as plastic is concerned. The Abu Dhabi based Rebound Plastic Exchange aims to fill this gap and facilitate the trade of 5 million tons of plastic waste by 2025. How does it work and what are the challenges? Let's find out from our guest today, Mario Mal Mansuri, General Manager, Rebound Plastic Exchange. Welcome to our show, Ms. Maria. Thank you, Chaitana. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, so, let me begin by asking, talking about plastic. Which is now viewed as the the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> so when you go out and talk about plastic, the general perception is to get rid of plastic completely. And how hard is it to communicate or convince people uh, towards to uh, make a case for plastic trade? I mean, um, people assume that plastics is the bad guy, as mm. you've uh, pointed out. People think the chemicals and toxins in plastic is what makes it bad. But it's bad because it gets polluted into our environment. See, if we treat plastic and our waste in a better manner um, and help the recycling industry that has been existing around for quite a few decades, then a lot of pollution matters would be resolved. When speaking with people, it's important to remind them that plastic not only protects our food and, and drinking uh, bottled water, but it also protects our medicine, um, our healthcare equipment. It's in our cars, in our homes, in our glasses, in the toothbrush we use. So there's a lot of uses for plastic and we cannot simply throw it away. Uh, we cannot um, reinvent another material as good and as cheap and as durable as plastic, we can definitely reuse and uh, recycle better. Right. When we talk about plastic, the three mantra is reuse, reduce and recycle. Your approach to plastic is somewhat different and it is, I believe it goes deep into the problem. Yeah. Um, so why did you choose to start something like uh, plastic trading? Sure. Um, I mean, Kirtana, with um, plastics to start with, and you mentioned uh, banning single use. Banning single use is a step in the right direction because it basically tackles the first mantra of reducing. Yes, we don't need as many plastic straws. Yes, we don't need as many plastic cutleries and takeout shops, etc. But um, when we came with, with the concept of rebound plastic exchange, it was okay, there is demand to capture quality feedstock because we know that resources are finite, we can only produce so much virgin resins, so why don't we reincorporate what we've already produced and make more value out of it mm -hmm. and reuse it more, recycle it in a better manner. And you see that technology and chemistry is keeping up. Today, there are applications that allow you to recycle better. Today, there are additives and chemical uh, incorporations that allow you to clean better and deodorize and, and, and remove coloring. So plastic is meant to stay around for a very long time, maybe for the next 50 to 70 years, mm -hmm. uh, if not more. But the approach we took is let's create a, a regulated safe marketplace for sellers of the recycled plastics to find buyers that are looking for a specific type of material mm -hmm. because if you don't create an economic or financial incentive at the end of the day the recycling industry is not as commercially attractive on the long run it won't be able to sustain itself mm -hmm. so tomorrow if you have your children coming back and saying no, well, I don't mind using a plastic bottle because then I will remove the cap, the lid, I'll remove the, um, the wrap around it uh, and I would recycle it. This increases PET, our pet in the uh, supply chain. The demand meets the supply, the prices are lower and everyone benefits. So it's a mindset, it's a, it's a shift, but uh, we want to tackle 
the excessive amount of supply that we see today of plastics in landfills and oceans, but also in households and corporate offices, etc., make a dollar sign revenue out of it and um, just make a rebound plastic exchange part of the solution to reducing plastic pollution. So do you agree that plastic is not the problem? The management of plastic is? It, is, it isn't. Plastic mm -hmm. is not the problem. Mm -hmm. um, look, waste management needs to be taught at a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, different countries around the world are advanced at certain stages, um, which is why we have a fragmented or let's say a disproportion in how waste management happens in country A versus country B. Um, we do need to separate that source because then that means that the waste or the trash is, is cleaner um, and then less contamination so easier to be put on the conveyor belt and clean than the process so it's these small tips and tricks that if they're embedded in a household or within an individual it goes a long way and then the relationship with plastic changes because i mean do you see how now in the hotels or in the hospitality sectors, they're replacing water bottles, the plastic water bottles, with glass jars. Right. But if you look at it from an environmental perspective, the carbon emissions produced from glass mm -hmm. is much more, even with the transportation, mm -hmm. much more than plastic. Mm -hmm. So, okay, if I can reuse a water bottle so many times, and if I can recycle it, mm -hmm. and it can be converted again into a new bottle, right then why would I make life so difficult? Yes. You know? so, so that's my opinion. I don't think plastic is a bad person. Mm -hmm. I think we need to manage our waste better. Mm -hmm. And it goes across all types of mm -hmm. material. But why we focused on plastic is because it's the most um, durable, versatile, but also uh, most tangible right. to everyone. And there's a lot of ways that we can use it and mm -hmm. integrate it into new products, okay. whether it's furniture, whether it's mm -hmm. cars, whether it's um, aesthetics, whether it's frames. So mm -hmm. there's so much that can be done with uh, recycling plastic. You can keep it in the loop forever. Right? Definitely. Yes. So your journey is quite impressive. Yes. You were in the New York cabinet, yeah. uh, contributed to three projects like uh, writing for writing policies, and now you are into a totally different uh, how did this journey happen yeah, at what point in time did you think okay this is what i want to do here though, hereafter i mean um growing up in the uae uh, our founding father sheikh zayed had a lot of photos uh, of him captured around nature around irrigation agriculture uh, but also in terms of just the environment as a whole. And we see it today across the different leaderships that we have. So naturally growing up, I just felt a more um, emotional uh, deviation or let, let's say emotional uh, gravitation towards the environment. Uh, starting at a very young age, self-taught about many animals, had fat degradations. But then during the pandemic is when we all notice, and I'm sure you can agree, that everything we touched had so much plastic around it. Whether it was the groceries we ordered online, whether it was just the household necessities, whether it was even the COVID kits mm -hmm. and testings. So day by day, when, when we were all sitting at home, but then the environmental impacts and the, and the threats on a global scale um, in global reports that were published by the World Bank or WEF, had to do with environmental elements. I was like, okay, what's going wrong? Mm -hmm. So one of the pressing matters after uh, climate and carbon was plastic. Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, we have so much plastic around us. Why is it not reaching the demand? If we look at the big brands and what they've committed to the Allen MacArthur Foundation, mm -hmm. we realize that there is a huge gap on a yearly basis up to 6.3 million tons of plastic and a minimum mm -hmm is being searched for, but is not being found. Mm -hmm. So we started tackling um, the topic back in September, 2020, I worked with a group of global experts. Mm -hmm. We were like 15 or 16 in total, and we really started looking at the pain point. Now, my background helped me because 
working for the government at a very young age and uh, mind you I used to intern and volunteer ever since I was in high school so even with that perception of okay government set the stage and they pave the pathway but private sector is what drives the GDP and the economic um, returns on individuals across uh, every country or community True. so Having robust policies, flexible legislations, and adhering to global requirements and global governments is a must. Mm -hmm. But to tackle a global problem that has a financial revenue stream, mm -hmm. it needs to be done by the private sector. Mm -hmm. Which is why, you know, the cabinet helped me understand how to tackle a global environmental problem in a financial matter mm -hmm. where the governments are happy with the trades. Mm -hmm. So I was able to switch hats mm -hmm. in between, but um, very fortunate for all the experiences because now every time there's a decision, mm -hmm. having been a civil servant, we always ensure that every decision we do in the Bank Classic Exchange mm -hmm. is regulatory compliant. Right. That's what I was coming to in the next yeah. question as well. So one thing I found very fascinating about Rebound is that it's very keen on high quality assurance mm -hmm. and then transparency and certification protocol. Yeah. Why did you want to bring these three magic words into the system? Because there are the three magic words that don't exist elsewhere. Um, we spoke with a lot of buyers and we also spoke with a lot of custom agents mm -hmm. and government ports. Quality was always the repeated kind of red flag for them. Okay. Oh, we would get a sample that looks amazing but mm -hmm. then when the batch comes through mm -hmm. it's just like a completely different sort mm -hmm. of material or like oh we get shipped containers of plastic that has hazardous or contaminants or non-sanitary mm -hmm. disposable uh, material in between the bales so we said okay um, if a buyer is looking for a certain material does the con do these countries allow for those materials to come through? How do they look like? What is the contamination level? What should we do to ensure that? So that had to do with the quality assurance mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. With the transparency, we're very transparent with both our buyers and sellers in terms of opportunities, in terms of uh, steps to take mm -hmm. to be able to trade on the platform, but also how we do what we do. Mm -hmm. The certification protocol really was an extra unique and um, added stage because a lot of platforms today do not vet their members mm -hmm. and this is one of the key concerns of governments which is we don't know who mm -hmm. the user coming from another country or in the country is versus who the end user is the, is the end user able to process these bales or flakes or pellets into uh, what they want to do so we're like, we have to verify and ensure that facilities are running safely, no child labor, no health and safety, um, red flags or concerns. So we really wanted to be that reassuring factor mm -hmm. between the public and the private sectors, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, the material can be found and the trade can happen. But if the trade doesn't happen correctly, there probably won't be a second trade. Yeah. So we wanted to tackle all the elements, all of the concerns and clarifications mm -hmm. from the start so that we can gain recognition and, and we can gain trust mm -hmm. of the market. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know this as well, this market is based on a handshake. Right. So when we came to digitalize mm -hmm. a solution like this, that on its own was a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, instead of picking up the phone and saying, uh, please send this material over, now I have to go online and, and order by now. Um, so that concept was already very unique. So we kept a lot of the day-to-day -day business as usual practices mm -hmm. still available mm -hmm. so that the industry slowly adapts to turning into an automated classic trading marketplace, mm -hmm. but also to provide opportunity to the industry. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are just stuck with the material. So we're like, okay, if they have good material, then we have really good buyers for mm -hmm. them. If they have somewhat of an okay material, we might also have buyers mm -hmm. for them. So we really try to move the plastic, keep it out of the environment and in the economy. Right. So there's a lot of meticulous planning happening like step by step. We have yeah. A lot of things going on. So it's glad that you mentioned about the digital platform. So uh, your team must be working with all the recyclers. Recycling industry is such where the business is 
transfer from one genera- generation to another. Yeah. So how is it to convince people to use a digital platform? Uh, because it is very convenient to do business over the call or like yeah. a certain handshake business. Definitely. It's a daily learning process. Every buyer, every seller, every member we have on the platform has a different approach to how they like to do business. Mm-hmm. So imagine on our end as RPX, we need to accommodate what they want and adjust our selves to them mm-hmm. to make them happy because mm-hmm. they are our stakeholders. So when it comes to um, the recycling industry, especially with, especially with plastic, many of them are family owned or family run businesses. So I would be speaking to the son, whether it's the dad or the grandfather that does the final call. Um, I'm very glad to say everyone sees the opportunity that we're presenting them with because automatically they say, okay, rebound is dealing with the government issues. Mm-hmm. Rebound is dealing with the quality issues. Rebound is verifying my buyer or seller on my behalf. So we do so much of the homework on their behalf that they find us as an extension to their procurement team. Once as well, um, we're very thankful. Uh, We've been approached by um, a few big brands. Uh, We've been partnering with a lot of different um, companies from different industries. Governments are starting to open up their doors and then host us at meeting desks more often. So the momentum is is growing and the uh, acceptance is there from almost everywhere around the world. Uh, But we have to continue pushing and and making sure that this will, uh, you know, keep on moving and sustaining itself. Uh, We need to ensure that our members are always satisfied and that we can present them with the the best opportunities and being based out of Abu Dhabi and the UAE um, we always say that rebound is from the UAE to the world because the UAE as a country was built based on synergies and collaborations it was seven Emirates that came together so you can only imagine with a global business coming together as businesses but also companies in different fields makes a huge impact and difference. It keeps the costs lower, it keeps the um, human capital more, you get mm-hmm. insights from everyone, everywhere, and uh, it just helps Rebound Classic Exchange uh, be the company it is today. So what are the biggest learnings in the last three months, or uh, to say the last two years since you started working on this big project? Um, biggest learnings is Number one, uh, try to understand where each uh, business is coming from. Uh, Some businesses have been running for more than 30 years, Mm -hmm. so they've been doing business a certain way. We cannot expect them to change. So it's um, the flexibility required to enter this market. The other um, learning uh, point was um, as long as there is an economic or financial incentive across the value chain, uh, it makes sense. To pursue a commercial deal and it makes sense to do what we're doing. Um, the third learning curve is really everyone wants to keep plastic out of the environment and that helps keep our messaging uh, stronger in our positioning because no one has tackled recycled plastic feedstock the way we have. Mm-hmm. We invested a lot of our resources in understanding the technicalities and the processes but also the regulations. Mm-hmm. So. Um, and you can only imagine all these pillars have come with a lot of readings and meetings and, and lawyers and technical advisors. So there was so much to wrap our heads around. Um, but it's been a wonderful um, learning journey and it hasn't ended. Every day is a learning uh, day for us. Uh, but the industry is, is starting to pick up mm-hmm. on uh, plastic as a feedstock. Mm-hmm. Uh, the market produ- projections are uh, estimated to reach around uh, $46 billion by uh, the ne- in the next few years, the next three years, I assume. So a lot of mm-hmm. revenue or let's say profit uh, to be captured there. And the final learning is that every region has its own capacity, but also its own uh, opportunity. Uh, So the type of material you find 
in the East is much more different than the type of material you find in the West, mm -hmm. but also the type of material you might find in Indonesia mm -hmm. might be complementary to the type of material that's being processed in Vietnam. Right. So it's understanding on a local scale when you zoom into the map what can be done in plastic recycling. Great. So let's take a deep dive into plastic recycling. Mm -hmm. um, one of the many challenges in achieving uh, plastic circularity is getting access to high quality plastic feedstock. So what are the barriers? Why are we not able to achieve this? The barriers come from, so the quality of the plastic depends on how not only you create mm -hmm. the plastic at the start, so the virgin process mm -hmm. of it, but also the collection and retrieval process mm -hmm. of it. See, if you're contaminating a clean water bottle or a clean shampoo, like after being used the shampoo bottles, it will probably get very contaminated if you put it in your household, uh, one household bin, mm -hmm. because then you have different types of waste being mixed in it. Mm -hmm. So we don't find a lot of high quality feedstock, mainly because separation at source doesn't exist at, a, at the scale that it's going to exist in. This is where education and awareness plays a role. This is where some companies today are starting to pick up on that and are trying to incentivize consumers to participate mm -hmm. in separating that source um, but also the awareness in general like you need to tell people this plastic can be used for this so they would be more prone to recycling or to bringing it back to the grocery store to the local supermarket they took mm -hmm. it from and deposit it there mm -hmm. and maybe get you know somewhat of a brochure or incentive to get a discount on their next purchase so collection remains to be the uh, biggest key barrier along with the education of the plastics. Right. The plastic recycling issue uh, is an issue impacted by everything from infrastructure, design, engineering and moreover uh, recycled plastic is costlier than virgin plastic. Mm -hmm. So if you are a recycler, how to navigate among all these challenges, what are the factors you should consider to keep moving? not be bogged down by all these challenges? Um, every business, I think, has its own challenges when it comes to plastic recycling based on the country or region they're in. Um, as a recycler, the more feedstock I have, the less my operational costs. Mm. Therefore, I'd be able to compete better against the virgin. Mm. Now, virgin plastic is dependent on fuel prices. Mm. So, um, oil, uh, sorry, oil prices. So if um, nowadays we're seeing demand of recycled resins is increasing, even the petrochemicals are starting to invest in, in plastic mm -hmm. recycling and in retrieving yeah. uh, recycled resins. So then we start realizing that in the future, most probably recycled resins would decouple mm -hmm. from the virgin uh, pricings. And so the more feedstock um, a recycler can have, mm -hmm. the lower the financial, let's say, um, uh, complications they have to face because the biggest investment of a recycler is the machinery. Right. So the better the machinery, the more feedstock you feed into the machinery, um, the lower the cost would be. And then when it comes to government regulations and other costs, mm -hmm. um, each country can have its own um, way to navigate against. Uh, solutions are there and, and they're changing and advancing by the day. So, um, and we're always here and happy to help, of course. Okay, okay. So the UAE is in the process of developing an action plan for plastic management. What are the aspects that the country should consider when making this plan? Um, I think the first element is uh, engaging with the community at a household, school, but also office level, um, educating them, raising awareness, but also enabling the resources to collect and recycle and reduce and reuse. So that is one very important pillar. The second that would come in is bringing um, the brands and the corporates together that are involved in the recycling industry, mm -hmm. whether they're the processors or whether they're the end users mm -hmm. or where the demand pull is from, basically. Bringing them together, ensuring that there's a streamlined of products that is flowing in at a constant mm -hmm. or consistent scale. And then 
also leveraging its um, opportunity to trade within other GCC countries and bring in more feedstock. Um, and overall, these three initiatives, or let's say these three approaches, would push a strong global message that um, yes, the Middle East or the UAE is based out of the petrochemical um, economy, and we have the, one of the many of the largest petrochemical companies actually here in the GCC, but they're setting the stage to thinking from I think 2014 or 2016 we've been thinking about okay what after what is the post oil economy right. and that's why we're able to have a lot of uh, recycling players here in the GCC uh, that are advanced uh, that have some of the best technologies food grade and um, others so uh, there's a lot that can be derived out of this uh, action plan that they're putting together. Right. The UAE is pre uh, preparing to host COP28. So, what do you think COP28 should achieve for uh, recycling industry to advance a sustainable future? I think the COP28 um, should again set the stage. Every event that comes to the UAE uh, sets the stage, raises the bar beyond uh, yeah. high. Uh, we saw it in all of the global events that our country mm -hmm. has hosted. And uh, when it comes to COP28, I believe the UAE would be presenting solutions rather than recommendations. I think the UAE will be presenting opportunities rather than focusing on the challenges and the barriers. So for me, COP28 and 2023 would be the year of sustainable solutions. Mm -hmm. It would be a beautiful story unfolded and, and led uh, out of um, the Expo 2020 uh, site, which was built magnificently, mm -hmm. a lot of sustainable approaches there, waste management. So we are walking the talk and I'm mm -hmm. sure the global uh, parties and then the conference of parties will see that as well. Okay. If you were to give some advice as well, budding entrepreneurs from your experience uh, building this uh, plastic exchange, what would they be? Uh, when it comes to the type of work, or let's mm -hmm. say the mindset um, of an entrepreneur, I think entrepreneurs must be very resilient, very humble. They must always wear the student hat. Mm -hmm. um, they must always see themselves learning and, and pushing. Um, they have to do something they like and something they're passionate about. Uh, they should start working on something that they don't mind losing sleep over mm -hmm. for the first few months because usually the first few months or the first um, two to three years are the most challenging times and as an advice from me it would be um, don't look at challenges as a problem always look at a challenge as many opportunities um, if one door closes 10 others will open as long as you believe and you push for what you believe for. And um, sometimes if entrepreneurship feels like a lonely journey uh, because you're in your head, you're in your thoughts about mm -hmm. why is this not working? Why is this not happening? Mm -hmm. I want this to go uh, this way. Don't focus on the what's going wrong, rather mm -hmm. look at what is working and what will work and how you can change to make it work uh, better, but um, never lose contact and touch with your family and friends. I hear it a lot that a lot of entrepreneurs cut out their social mm -hmm. life, etc. And I think it's the social setting around you that mm -hmm. helps you uh, cultivate better ideas and be more creative. So that's from my end. How are you enjoying your entrepreneurial journey? I'm enjoying it. I'm. Um, it is, it's not easy, mm -hmm. um, but it's rewarding knowing that I'm trying to do something um, that pushes a greater message for everyone on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, we did not take a local or a regional approach, we took a global approach. Um, and. It's just about listening to others and, and hearing what they have to say and then adjusting the business um, processes to that. Mm -hmm. So it is fun, it's very stressful, okay. but, um, but I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's just believing in why we started what we started right. that uh, keeps me at ease and, and that very like, at, at a zen state at sometimes. Yes.
It's wonderful. Yeah. So to conclude the interview, I would like you to speak about your love for elephants. <laughs> so uh, just for the listeners, um, my journey into the environment started by loving elephants at a very young age, around eight or nine years old. I would tend to grab elephant related uh, storybooks for children or a uh, teddy elephant, etc. Until my parents realized that and started uh, helping me learn more about the environment. And that's where habitat degradation started taking place. That's where, um, you know, uh, the corals, the reefs, the sea, etc. And um, elephants have always played an important uh, role or a an important opening into my environmental journey and with economics being my favorite subject uh, in school and in university uh, basically I decided to do something both economically and environmental friendly. Okay that's yeah. great. So even elephants are called the ecological engineers in a forest right? Yeah they have a lot of special features yeah, so I'm so glad. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us on this podcast and spending so much time with us talking about plastic recycling, your journey in Rebound and all that. Thanks so much. Of course. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Kirtana. The pleasure is mine. Thank you.